I want you to turn with me today to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to leave Joshua for a while. We've been in Joshua for about 48 weeks, I guess. So today we're going to start a new beginning, a new season, or a new series in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you're visiting with us today, let me say, glad to see you. Thank you for being here today. Please make yourself right at home. Thank you for coming today. Regular attenders, thank you for your faithfulness week after week. It's great each week to look back and see more and more chairs being filled. It's exciting to see what the Lord is doing, not only at 11, but at 8 o'clock and 9.15. God is doing a great work, and we praise the Lord for that. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 1. And just keep your Bibles open today. If you're reading your Bible through cell phone or some other electronic means, just keep them to where you can get back to them today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Heavenly Father God, that all the praise, all the singing, all the music, all the hand clap, Lord, all the standing, Lord God, and the lifting of our hands has been a sweet, sweet sight in your presence. I pray, Heavenly Father God, that you have received the praise and the worship as, Lord, we have done our best to give you our best. I pray, Heavenly Father God, that as you have received our praise and worship, we now, Lord God, change places and we come to the place of receiving your word. That, Heavenly Father God, today that we will have a great diet, a balanced diet, Heavenly Father, of praise, worship, and word. That, Heavenly Father God, that it will give us strength, Lord God, to meet the day, give us strength to meet life, give us strength to meet the difficulties and the challenges that we face in life. I pray, Heavenly Father, for the divine anointing, Lord God, that not only breaks every yoke, but Heavenly Father, that makes it very easy to speak, very easy to hear, very easy to understand. Pray, Lord God, that you will be in every word that is said, lead and guide and direct and instruct me and teach me in the way that I should go. Help us, Heavenly Father, when we leave here today to be more knowledgeable of your word, a stronger relationship with you, going forth in the power and in the glory and in the might of the Holy Spirit. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Would you quickly ask that person, if you don't know who they are beside you, what their name is. If you do know what they are, who they are, ask somebody else what their name is and welcome them in the house. I'm Mike. While you're being seated, there is a team at every information center that would love if you're visiting today to get, from, get some information from you. And also we have sign-up sheets for Relay for Life that this church will be participating in. Debbie and I are participating in it. would love to participate with you. There are sign-up sheets at every uh, exit as you leave today. And we hope that you'll take some, time, take some time to fill one out. So many times when you look at your Bible, and when a person thinks about their Bible or reads their Bible, they open it up. And they begin to read, and yet, as they read, they really don't understand what they're reading. So many times, people, as they read the Bible, they're going, I know that verse, or I know that chapter, but how does that apply to me? Well, what's the history that's behind that chapter? One of the things that's very important to understand is not just reading the Bible, but understanding the background of what you're reading. Understand when the writer is writing what he is writing from, the perspective that he is using, the experience that he is using. So that when you open the Word of God, that you're reading it, that you're able to really know that writer. Several years ago, there was a, a man in our denomination that gave me a book, and I didn't understand the book. I read the book several pages, a couple of chapters, and I went, I cannot understand what he's writing to save my life. The more that I would try to read it, the more confused I became. But as God would have it, I was, had the opportunity to meet with him and to have lunch. And by sitting at the table and hearing him talk, sitting at the table and hearing where he came from in life. I was able by sitting and talking to the author to be able to understand the person that was writing the book. When I went back home and pulled the book out, I was able to read that book and understand it 
because I saw it from where he was writing. I was able to get it from where he was sending it from. When you read the Bible, it's important to not just read it, but understand what you're reading. When you get to 1 Peter, 1 Peter is a very, very powerful chapter or book in the Bible. It's very powerful as it applies to every one of us in this building, every day in life. 1 Peter is a chapter that, as the Lord led me to it, or the book of 1 Peter that the Lord led me to, I think some of it had to do with on Wednesday nights been preaching the book of Acts and studying the book of Acts, and for several weeks we were discussing uh, Peter's life. The more that I talked about his life, the more that I became very interested in the man. The more that I was interested in the man, the more that I began to learn about his life. And so when the Lord put into my spirit 1 Peter, I was excited because of the study that we had already done. When you get to 1 Peter, you need the background. And so today I'm not going to try to bore you, but I want to give you background of why we're going to be in 1 Peter. Why 1 Peter is so important in the day and time that we're living the lessons that are taught out of 1 Peter that will apply to every one of our lives. And so that you'll understand that when you open the Bible to 1 Peter, why he even wrote this in the first place. When you go all the way back in history to when Rome was burned, when Rome was burned, the believers or the Romans believed that the emperor at that time, Nero, was the one that was behind the burning of Rome. The Romans always believed that Nero is the one that took Rome and basically burned it to the ground. One reason for them believing this was is because Nero had an addiction. His addiction wasn't to drugs or alcohol or to sex or things such as that. He had an addiction to building. He was a man that absolutely loved to build. He was a man that every time there was an empty spot, he was a man that was building a building. When it finally came to the place that Rome was so full that no other buildings could be built, then what Nero decided to do was the only way to build more was to tear down what was already there. And so he had a plan that what he would do was is that he would come in and he would destroy the buildings that were already there in Rome. When the city burned, the Romans were devastated. Matter of fact, their culture is something that went up in flames just like their city did. And as they watched their city burn, they watched a lot of their heritage, they watched a lot of their culture burn at the same time. Every religious connection that they had at that time was destroyed in the fire. And so this fire was a devastating thing where Nero never thought of the devastation that he would bring. The Romans' temples were burned. Their shrines were burned. Their personal household items were all consumed in the fire. When Nero burned the city, it left the people in the city not only homeless, it left them helpless, and it left them hopeless. They not only lost their homes in the fire, they lost all of their religious elements in the fire. In the fire, they lost family members, they lost friends, and they lost people they had known all of their lives. The Romans were devastated. They were extremely bitter at the fact that Rome had been burned, and they were very resentful of Nero for burning Rome. Nero is a man that being in authority and liked the praise of people. He is a man that realized that he had made a very serious mistake. And so he realized the situation that he had created now had to be redirected to get the anger away from him and to redirect that anger to somebody else. Nero was a man that knew that Christians were hated. He knew they were hated because they associated with Jews and, and because they were associated with Jews and because they were seen hostile when it came to Roman culture. So Nero is a man that saw that what he would do is he would redirect the blame to the Christians for the fire and the burning of Rome. What Nero wanted to be was a hero, not a zero, so he did something bizarro. He spread the word that it was the Christians that set the city on fire, sent the blame away from him, put all the blame on Christians. It resulted in the Christians being persecuted. By them being persecuted, there was revenge that went out all throughout the Roman Empire, and every Christian's life was at stake because of the burning at Rome. When you look at the Christians in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, they were all persecuted for something they didn't have anything to do with. And even though they were innocent, Nero was shooting all the blame to them. And all the citizens of Rome are now taking their eyes off Nero, putting their eyes on the Christians. If anyone professed that they knew Jesus Christ, if anyone professed to be a Christian, they were persecuted. Christians were blamed for everything, from national disasters to economic downturns. Anything that went wrong, Christians got the blame. 
It resulted in the Christians having little security, little social status, little recourse when it came to government protection. The believers' lives were filled with persecution and they were filled with suffering. Every day that they got up, they suffered. During the night, they suffered with thoughts of what it would be like the next day when they arose. Any hope of things changing faded fast. The more that they hoped that it would change, the worse that it got. Right as they thought that they had no hope, right when they thought that God had forsaken them, right when they thought that no one would ever care about them and they would just live their life persecuted and in suffering, there was a letter that came to them. And that letter that came to them was a letter that didn't say, hope you're doing well, I'm praying for you. But it was a letter that came to them that gave them encouragement. And it gave an explanation of the suffering that they were going through. The letter was a reminder that when they would read that letter, it was a reminder of the reward that would be at the end of their earthly life. And though things were bad now and hard now, that letter was a letter that gave them what they needed. It gave them reassurance that those Christians that were being persecuted for something they had nothing to do with, that letter that came to them was a letter that said, there's a better day that's coming. Hold on. There's a better day that's coming. Don't give up. It was a letter that gave them the strength that they needed to be able to handle life in the meantime while they waited for that better day. That letter that brought them that encouragement, that letter that answered their questions in life when they felt like life was not living, is what's called 1 Peter. 1 Peter is the letter that was sent to those people at the time that they thought, how in the world will I make it another day? When you think about it, you need to understand the world has not changed much since the time of Nero. Matter of fact, it's actually probably gotten worse, whether you think about it or not. And so when you look at it, you'll see that things haven't really changed much other than getting worse. We live in a world, though we look good, we sound good, and we act good, and we put a smile on our face. We live in a world that is filled with people that are crushed. We live in a world that is filled with people that are overwhelmed. We live with people that are stressed, people that are holding on with all that they've got. We live beside neighbors that though they come out in the yard with a smile on their face, there's devastation in their heart. And there's people that we work beside every day and probably sit beside in church that their life is filled with devastation, they're torn, and they're hopeless. And they come in and they're thinking, maybe this will be the day that things will change. Maybe this will be the day that Jesus will come back. Maybe this will be the day that it'll be the great escape that I've heard of all of my life. So we live in a world that is filled with people that are in that situation. Not only out of the church, but people that are in the church facing the same situation. People that are suffering not only from disease, but people that are suffering from abuse. People that are suffering from failure, from something that they set out to do and they failed miserably. And now because of the decision they made, there's the consequences that have followed and they're suffering miserably because of a mistake that they've made. Losses of some kind. Things that have just added up in their life to create stress and some are feeling abandonment feeling like nobody cares whether I live or whether I die. I don't know any other way to put it, and I'm going to try to turn it by the end of the service so you don't go home sad, but we live in a, home, a world filled with suffering. We live in a world that every day we hear about people that are suffering all over the world and right in our neighborhood. When there is suffering, suffering will always bring pain. You will never have suffering without experiencing pain. Pain is something that brings anguish, and when there's anguish that comes into your life, Right after that comes hopelessness. When suffering and pain and anguish and hopelessness are put together, what they can do is they can tempt a person to give up. They can tempt a person to turn back. They can tempt a person to say, what's the use in even trying? And sometimes they've tempted people and succeeded in people taking their own life because they can't live with the suffering that they're going through. People also suffer and they're persecuted for what they believe and what they stand for. If you stand for the Word of God in the day and time that we're living in, let me assure you, you will be persecuted. If you take a stand against what is sin and what is not sin, you will be persecuted. When you take a stand and what isn't popular with everybody and you stand and you say, God says it's wrong and it's wrong and you take that stand, don't think you're going to walk away from there not getting a few bruises on you somewhere. Because people today are not taking the stand that they used to take years ago. They're bending and they're bowing to anything man has to say because they want to remain popular and they want to have the connections that they have in life and they know taking a stand is not going to make them popular and it's definitely going to break connections. Matter of fact, the hope of the devil is that the persecution and the suffering, listen close, 
the hope of the devil is that the suffering and the persecution will result in people backing off. That will result in Christians uh, 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 turning their back and basically compromising their beliefs. And that Christians, instead of getting in fights, instead of having to go through it in family and all that, that Christians will just give in. The devil is hoping that Christians, that because you may have a family member in your family that, that lives a certain lifestyle and, and you don't want to risk losing that child, let me tell you what the devil is hoping. The devil is hoping you'll bend their way before they'll bend your way. He is hoping that the people will compromise, the people of God will compromise and, and say, because I don't want to risk a relationship. Let me tell you what, I would rather risk a relationship with somebody on this earth than I had with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you look and you'll see that there are many that are, that are turning back and compromising because they don't want to risk the outcome of that. As believers or Christians, we're exposed to a world system that is energized not by man, but is energized by Satan and the demons of hell. That's what's energizing the world that we're living in today. And if you've ever wondered why the world is so bad, look where the world is getting its energy. Look at where the world is being motivated from. Matter of fact, the, the goal of Satan has not changed since the days of Nero. Matter of fact, Satan's goal is to destroy the character, the credibility, and the integrity of God. And if you look at that and say, Pastor, I don't understand what that means. Let me say it one more time. Satan's goal is to destroy the character, the credibility, and the integrity of God. And you'd look at that and you'd say, how will Satan do that? Let me tell you what, Satan's smart enough to know that he can't do that by going to God and trying to do it one-on-one. -on -one. And so the scheme that Satan uses, the tactics that he uses, he uses to destroy the credibility, the character, and the integrity of the church and the people of God. And he says, if I can destroy, destroy the integrity and the credibility and the character of Christians, people that go to church on Sunday and sing the hymns, clap their hands and shout on the pulpit, if I can hit their integrity, if I can hit their credibility and their character, and if I can prove that their walk is not the same thing as their talk, and then all I'm doing is I'm telling the world don't live like they do because they're saying one thing and they're living another. And every time a Christian talks one way and lives another way, let me tell you what it's doing. It's not just hurting that Christian and it's hurting the, the kingdom and the glory of Almighty God that Satan is saying, look, there's another one that's doing exactly opposite of what they told you that you should do. Amen. Isn't it funny that God is mentioned or is not mentioned when things go right? When things are going right, God's not mentioned that much. A car plunges off of a bridge and everybody in the car is rescued. Nobody gets a scratch. And guess what it's called? Luck. And everybody says they were lucky. They went off that bridge and didn't get a scratch. They were lucky. The right people was in the right place. But isn't it funny when a tornado or a hurricane comes through, it's called an act of God. Matter of fact, you look at the devastating things, it's an act of God. You look at the great things and it's considered luck. You ain't hanging with me very well this morning. You need to understand, Satan wants people to see God. Satan wants people to see God as a destructive, non-caring, contradictive, and out-of-touch God. He wants God to be portrayed in that way. And I want to tell you, in this day and time, whether you recognize it or not, every day that's how God is being portrayed. That more and more, Satan is making sure that God is being mentioned at the wrong times and in the wrong thing. That God saves a life, nobody hears about it. But when there's something that happens like a North tornado, everywhere, everywhere, look what nature has done. Look what God or the act of God has done. He thrives on Christians that are not living the life. He thrives on things that he can accuse God of that people would look at God and say, why in the world do I want to serve a God like that? My life is better the way it is than serving a God that has all that devastation that's in there. Today we begin a new series. It's on 1 Peter. And this series is going to answer many questions that we have as Christians. It's going to go beyond the surface. It's going to go deep into there. When you read 1 Peter, there are three themes that's going to flow throughout the entire entire book. Three things that Peter is going to be talking about at the same time. And as you go through the book, you're going to be hearing it as you go through. The first theme is the theme of suffering. It starts at the first and it goes all the way through the end. All the way through 1 Peter, you're going to be hearing the theme of suffering. The second theme that you're going to be hearing about is the theme of grace. All the way through in every chapter, Peter makes sure that he talks about grace in every chapter. The second thing is grace. The third thing, the third theme that is there in 1 Peter is the theme of glory. As you 
you will hear Peter talking about glory and the glory of Almighty God. When you hear the themes of suffering and the theme of grace and the theme of glory, what you have to do is take those three themes and you wove them together. And as they are woven together, you will find that what happens when you put the grace, glory, and suffering together, it brings hope to Christians in times of trial and in times of persecution. That you know that yes, there's suffering, but yes, there's grace, and in the end, there's going to be glory. And you see how they all come together. Matter of fact, all of these three themes are summarized in one verse. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, and you'll see all three themes, how he puts them together. It says, may God, the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory, glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. He is saying that when you get it down deep in your soul, that there's going to be a perfecting, an establishing, a strengthening, and a settling in your being. But the main theme of Peter is hope. All the way from the first verse to the last, from the beginning to the last period in the book, the main theme that he talks about is hope, hope, hope. All the way through there. You need to understand about hope. Hope is not a complacency. When you read about hope in the Word of God, it is not a complacency. Hope is a confidence. It is a confidence that gives you the encouragement and the enablement that you need to get out of bed in the morning and make it all throughout the day and not mind going to bed and waking up the next morning. It is that encouragement and that enablement that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is that encouragement that is there. Hope is not a drug that sedates you so that you can deal with life. And that's what the world we live in now. We got a problem, there's a drug that'll fit that problem. But hope is not a drug that sedates us. But hope is a shot of energy that stirs us. It's a shot of energy that moves us in the right direction. When you look at hope, hope is not a, a hope serves as an anchor and it stabilizes us in the storms of life. That in the storms of life, when the wind is raging and the water is high, there's that hope that stabilizes me like an anchor. That when it's all said and done, I might be bruised, I might be dirty, but I'll still be standing by the power and the glory of God. When you look at hope, hope is a fuel. It's not only an anchor, it's a fuel. And hope is what moves us forward when everything else is trying to push us back. You look at it and say, where does hope come from? It comes from the same place that peace comes from. It comes from the same place that joy comes from. Hope is not a thing. Hope is a person. It is personified in the name the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you today, the day that you got saved, yes, you got delivered. Yes, you got saved. Yes, you had redemption. But the day that you got saved, not only did God clean you out, God started putting things back. He put peace inside of you, joy inside of you, and he put hope inside of you because in the name of Jesus Christ, everything you need is installed in you. And you say, how can I make it in the life that I'm living? You make it by knowing greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's the fact of knowing what God has put in me. Hope comes when we know Jesus Christ. To have Jesus is to have hope. To true Christian hope is more than hoping so. It is confident assurance of knowing so. That my God will, my God can, and my God is going to make sure I'm all right. Even if you're going through, through some tough times in your life, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you've got to keep your focus on him. Because what the devil wants to do is he wants you to focus on everything around you. And while you're focusing on things around you, you're forgetting to focus on who's in you. You're forgetting to focus on who owns the heavens and the earth. You're forgetting to focus on the one that created the heavens and the earth. And there is nothing too difficult for him to do. If he can take your focus on the outside, then hope goes with it. But if your focus stays to who Jesus is, then your hope is secure. Your hope is in place. And you're able to say, I'm able to do this in the name of Jesus Christ. You've got to remember that the crowns that you will wear in the future are made from the crosses that you bear in the present. And so if you're going to wear a crown in the future, it comes from bearing a cross in the present. Matter of fact, there can be no resurrection if there is no crucifixion. And sometimes God has to take us down so that God can resurrect us and bring us back up. That we can be what God would have us to be. The hope that Jesus had when he went to the cross going there knowing everything he was going to go through when he went into Jerusalem, knowing everything that he was going to go through. How did he do it? Yes, he had his eyes on the cross, but he had his eyes through the cross at the glory on the other side. 
but there was a hope that he had because he knew the word and the word was yes I'll die I'll die and I'll go on, on that cross and I'll die then I'm going to be put in a tomb but I'm not going to stay there it's Friday but Sunday's coming it's the fact that there's going to be hurt on one side and glory on the other side when you get to 1 Peter chapter 1, let me calm back down and act like I'm teaching instead of preaching. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, take that verse and commit it to memory. If you're going to make it, you can't make it off of man's words. You've got to make it off of God's word. And when you commit that to memory, not something that they just put on a bumper sticker, commit this to memory. What is it? May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you, let's make it personal and say, after I have suffered a while, will perfect, establish, strengthen, and will settle me. To anyone here that is unsaved, I've got to give you some news that I hate to give you, but you're without hope. Anybody here that is unsaved, you don't have any hope. The only hope you've got is in yourself, that you're strong enough to pull this thing out, that your money is powerful enough to get you out. If you die without Christ, you die without hope. If you die in this life, you die and go to an eternal hell without Jesus Christ in your life. People can tell you there is no hell. They can tell you there's no need in getting saved, but you better read your Bible and you'll find out even the devil believes that there's a hell. It's the fact of knowing that he knows where he's going to be put when this time is over. First Peter is a letter of hope and encouragement to those who know Jesus Christ and who serve him. Verse 1 starts out with the words. That's why I wanted you to keep your Bible open. Verse 1 starts out with the words, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now what's happening here, you're being introduced to the person that's writing the book. Peter's a man that is saying, I want you to know who's writing the book. And so Peter starts out by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice that he introduces himself as an apostle. You would look at that and you would think, wow, that's kind of a big title to put there. He probably could have put more, but he put down an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is a messenger that is sent in Christ's name to give Christ's message. An apostle signifies the highest office in the Christian church. He introduces himself in this manner. Not to be big, not to put on airs, but he introduces himself in this manner because Peter has understood something we've got to really catch in our life. To pretend what we do not have is hypocrisy. To pretend what we do not have is hypocrisy. When I pretend to be something that I'm not, I'm a hypocrite. But there's another side to that. To deny what we have is ingratitude. And so Peter recognizes that, that I don't want people to see me as all big and brave and bold, but yet he knows what has happened to him, and in the office that he is in, there is gratitude that needs to be given, and that's to the Lord Jesus Christ for all that he has given him. He is grateful for his position. He introduces himself as an apostle, not to get applause, but to give honor to God. I believe that if he was standing, he would say, don't applaud me, give honor to God. I am what I am by the grace of Almighty God. When you read throughout the Bible, you read particularly of three different apostles. You read about Paul, you read about John, and you read about Peter. The apostles were kind of like doctors. They were people that specialized in certain areas. And when you think about it, you may have read the writings of Peter, the writings of John, the writings of Paul, and you may not have really zeroed in, but if you zero in and hear what I'm saying here, you will see that they were like physicians that had areas of expertise. When you read about Paul, Paul was an apostle, but he was an apostle of faith. Most everything that he's writing about is about faith. And so Paul is known as the apostle of faith. When you read about John, and you read in Revelation, you read the letters of John, you've got to understand that John was known as the apostle of love. He was one that when he wrote, most of the time it contained love. When you read about Peter, Peter is the apostle that specialized in hope. And so when you read the writings of Peter, you're normally always going to be reading about hope. He is a man that focuses and specializes in making sure that the people of God have the hope that comes from God. When you look at Peter, you need to understand he wasn't always an apostle. When you think about Peter, he is a man that had a rough reputation at one time. He is a man that was known as being impetuous. A man is known as being impatient, bungling, fumbling, and a stumbling man. He was a man that was known that when he did open his mouth, he put his foot in his mouth every time that he opened it. Every time he tried to do something right, he did something wrong. Every time that he thought he was supposed to go right, he was supposed to go left. 
He is a man that when you read about him, you'd say, what a klutz this guy is. It's like he can't do anything right. But yet, that's the man that's writing this book. Then, when, I, as I said, he spoke up, he was a man that would always say things that was wrong. But when you look at Peter's life, you've got to understand he is one of the 12 disciples chosen by Jesus along with James and John and became part of that inner group. He is that inner group that Jesus did specialized training and teaching. He would have these men with him as he would spend time with them. If you want a perfect illustration of Peter, you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31. I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to refer to that. But a perfect illustration, a perfect picture that describes him is in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, 26 through 31. Even when Jesus met Peter and walked up to him, you would think that Jesus went up to him and go, how are you doing today? It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Jesus walked up to him basically and says, you're a mighty weak man. He is a man that walks up and immediately had him had 10 words with him and says, you're a mighty weak man. He right, realized right off the bat that here's a man that has faults. Here's a man that has all kind of history that's behind him. But Jesus went on to say, you are Peter, but I am going to make you a rock you are going to weak, you are weak now, but I am going to make you something that you've never been before. In other words, Jesus never turns people into rock stars. He turns them into rock people. He is saying that I turn you into something that's solid and will give you a solid foundation. When you look at Peter, you need to understand his name was Simon, but Jesus changed it to Peter, meaning a stone. It's been said, and as you read in the Bible, you'll read Simon Peter. Most of the time when you read about him, it's Simon Peter at the same time. You look at that and you say, why both names? Jesus gives him this name. His mom and daddy gave him that name. So why does he carry both names, Simon Peter? Here's an illustration. You need to understand that Simon speaks of the old nature that is prone to fail, where Peter speaks of the Christian's new nature that is going to be victorious as they serve Almighty God. So when he mentions Simon Peter, he is saying, here's the old man, here's the new man. This is what I used to be. This is what I am now. When I look back at Simon, I see a failure. When I look at Peter, I see somebody that's victorious every time that I think of Almighty God. Even though Peter was a man that had many defects in his life. He's one of the first people that recognized Jesus as the Messiah. One of the first ones that recognized him as the Son of God. As we've learned, the main theme of 1 Peter is Christian hope in time of trial and suffering. If there's anyone that ever knew about suffering, persecution, trial, it was Peter. Peter had not only experienced the threats, but experienced the beatings and imprisonments for what he believed because he was a man that wouldn't back down. He is a man that had also witnessed sufferings and loss of hope at times in his life. He is a man that knew what can, they can happen or can happen to a person who says that they profess the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because of fear and persecution. You remember it's the same man that I'm talking about. There was a man because of fear and persecution that denied Jesus in his time when he needed him the most. He was the man that when Jesus looked to him, he's a man that denied him. He's a man that bent under pressure. And a man that when pressure came and the stress came, he was a man that couldn't hold it. So the man that's writing this book, the man that's writing this letter that we're going to be digging into, is the same man that under pressure bent. The same man that suffered consequences for denying Jesus when he was asked point blank, did he know him? The man that wrote this book of encouragement to these people that were being persecuted is a man that after his failure is a man that experienced restoration. He is a man that knew what it was like to fail Jesus, but he was a man that realized the power of Jesus Christ to raise a failure up and be able to turn his life around and to give that failure hope. He is a man by the grace of God that he experienced restoration, a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He is a man that many saw as fumbling and bumbling that Jesus got into his life and restored him and gave him hope. He is a man that preached one of the greatest sermons, if not the greatest sermon that has ever been preached on the day of Pentecost and as he preached, 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord and everybody that had looked at him and called him bumbling and fumbling had to look and say, look what the Lord has done in this man's life. Now he's turned his life around. He is a man that Jesus had commanded him to go and strengthen his brethren and to feed his sheep. And part of that strengthening and feeding was writing this book as encouragement and personal witnesses. Many things in life come from people that write things. They come from things that they have heard about. They come from books that they have studied. They 
come because they've been in school and they've studied a certain person and they write about that. When you read about Simon Peter and you read 1 Peter, don't think of a man that sat down and wrote what he had heard somebody else write about. He is a man that writes from experience. He is a man that had no hope and he found hope in Jesus Christ. He is a man that knew what it was like to have peace in the midst of the storm. He is a man that knew what it was like to fail miserably and to be brought up again. He is not writing as a big author somewhere in a big office. He is a man that is saying, I write to you of the knowledge that God gave me firsthand. He is a man that is saying, I've been there, I've done that. I've been down, I've been hurt, I've been persecuted, and I have suffered, but blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave me hope that I could rise again and be everything that God would have me to do. He is a man that has been called unlearned and ignorant. In the Bible, he is called unlearned and ignorant. But yet, look in these verses right here in the first three. And let me tell you some of the places we're going to be going and dealing with. Peter mentions these things that some of the educated didn't even know what he was talking about. The rabbis, the priests had no idea of what he's talking about. And he begins to deal with doctrines of election, foreknowledge, sanctification, obedience, the blood of Jesus, the Trinity, the grace of God, salvation, revelation, glory, and faith. All of them combined together to give us hope. And all the while he is writing about suffering, he is emphasizing hope. He is saying that in the day and in the time that we live, and you're wondering, is there any hope? And is the news ever going to get any better? Dominique, you're going to have some good news one of these days. The, the, is the news ever going to get any better? He is saying, absolutely, there's a better day that's coming in the by and by. You're going to see me raise you up. You're going to see me deliver you out. And you're going to see the power and the glory of God. But there can be no resurrection without a crucifixion. There can be no crown without a cross that you have to bear. You know what Peter says? Hold on, baby. Hold on. There's a better day that's coming. Just hold Hold on. Everything's going to work out all right. He's saying, I've been there, and I've done that, and everything is going to be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Just hold on. It'll be all right in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It'll be all right in Jesus' name. It'll be all right. It'll be all right in the name of Jesus. You say, how do you know you got hope? I can walk like a rooster and tell you I know I got hope. You know how? Because I've got Jesus. And when I've got Jesus, I've got hope. There is a hope that's like a peace that passes all understanding. Regardless of where you are in life, going through things in life, the devil will give you many choices. Number one is suicide. Kill yourself. Just eliminate your life. There's no hope for you. Let me just tell you, you can kill the body, but you can never kill the soul. Suicide's not an option. You can never kill the soul. It's a soul that will live forever, ever and ever. Don't believe the lie of the devil. When he says your excuse is taking your own life, don't believe that. Believe the word of God that says there's a better day that's coming. Though your city has been burned, and though you're being lied about, though you're being blamed when you're innocent, you hold on, there's a better day that's coming. Peter's a man that writes literally and practically. A man that writes from his heart, writes from experience. To those that are being beat up, pushed around, he says, hang on, hang on, there's a better day that's coming. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you in our tough day. We come to you, Heavenly Father God, when wrong is becoming right, where stands are not being taken, where Heavenly Father God, Christians are going to be persecuted more and more. Lord, I don't believe we've seen anything yet in that area either. That persecution, by claiming to know Jesus Christ and claiming Him as Lord and Savior, we're going to be persecuted. We might as well get used to that. But we need to know there's a hope in the midst of the persecution that our God's not rolling over and playing dead, but one day He will rescue us. Heavenly Father, there's some in this building today that came in here without hope. They've lost hope for their marriage. They've lost hope for their kids. They've even lost hope for themselves. Some Heavenly Father God 
I didn't mention this in the other two services, Lord, but you're just putting it so heavy in my heart. Some sitting here today have even thought about what's the best way to end my life. Just get out of this thing called life. And Lord, I address that today by saying, turn to Jesus. Trust Jesus. Don't trust a liar that would tell you to take your own life. Father, I come to you today, Lord God, for those that came in here, Lord God, wondering, will it ever get any better? That, Lord God, that as we get deeper into 1 Peter, that, Heavenly Father God, we will see how he just opens his life and opens the Word of God to us, that we know how to live, how to live successfully through the kingdom and the glory of God. Even when we have nothing, we can be more successful than those that have everything. So, Father, I pray today for those that are here, that came in here, have no hope. They came in here, Lord God, where hope seems gone. That, Lord, you would stir their heart one more time because you live within them. That you'd stir them one more time to say, there is hope because I'm in you. There is hope and you're going to make it. And let this message be like the message that Peter sent to those that were being persecuted. And, Lord God, today be a day of change and a day of hope. Your eyes closed, your heads bowed. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd be a horrible pastor to let you go home without saying this. If you do not know Jesus Christ, you're a person with no hope. You're trying to do it all by yourself. There's no hope in man. Man changes, his attitude changes, his mind changes. God says, I change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll never change you. He goes on to say, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Trust me and I'll give you hope. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm just being honest with you. You have no hope. And He's here as not only your Savior, but as your hope, as your healer, as your redeemer, as your sanctifier. He's here to resurrect you from being down. Would you slip your hand in the air today if you do not have Jesus in your life today? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. And eyes are closed and heads are bowed. Thank you for those hands that I see that are going up today. Thank you. Thank you up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With eyes closed and heads bowed. Thank you for that hand that I see there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want this to happen for you today. I want you all to bow your heads as everybody else is bowing your heads. And I want you to begin a relationship today. I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ. Like I'm introducing you to someone sitting beside you. I want to introduce you to someone that will be beside you all your life. And I just want you to pray this simple prayer. Father, please forgive me of all my sins and all my shortcomings. I need you. I need peace. I need salvation. I need hope. I need another opportunity to get it right. So today I give you all my sins, all my bad, all my guilt and all my shame. And I ask you to enter my life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Those of you that raised your hands, if you'd see me afterwards, I've got a Bible that I'd like to give you. It's called Start. It helps you get started right where you are, that you'll be able to start that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone here today that needs prayer, you're going through some things that just looks hopeless, and you just need the people in the church just to come and gather around and pray for you. They're going to be singing. The altars are open. I'm going to ask you not to leave for a few minutes because somebody could be making a decision and a stir in that row could cause that person to change their mind could be somebody right now that's still deciding do I want to go to that altar or not and a commotion could cause those people to not make that decision so give me just a few more minutes they're going to sing the altars are open if you need prayer for anything these altars are open and we love you and we want to help you and we want to pray for you in Jesus name Lord, I come, Lord, I come. take my